Next, on Book TV's Afterwards, New York Times Magazine contributor Peggy Orenstein examines sexual culture and young male masculinity. She's interviewed by author Jared Yates Sexton. Afterwards is a weekly interview program with relevant guest hosts interviewing top nonfiction authors about their latest work. All Afterwards programs are also available as podcasts. Congratulations, Peggy Orenstein, on the release of your book, Boys and Sex. Um, I wanted to begin our conversation with a, um, an interesting theme that I kept coming back around to in, in your book, which I think illuminates a, a, a lot of this historical moment, a lot of the contradictions uh, that we currently have. In, in your research, it, it seemed that the young men that you talked to have at least the beginnings of an understanding of the, um, the changing politics uh, around sex and, and, and gender. And a lot of them even go so far as to offer their pronouns. They talk about feminist concepts such as consent and sort of these changing uh, conditions. But they all seem haunted by past ideas of masculinity and sexuality. In one case, you wrote that a young man was critical of the classic markers of masculinity, but he also aspired to them. It feels like there's a ghost of masculinity and sexuality that's following a lot of these young men around, and I was hoping you could talk about that. Yeah, it's actually almost as if they've uh, layered all these new expectations on top of all the old ones without really challenging or looking at or eliminating the old ones. So they're in a real state of conflict. So on one hand, yeah, guys, you know, they see women as deserving of their place in the classroom, as deserving of their place on the playing field, as deserving of being leaders as they are. And yet, you know, that's all in the public arena. And in their private lives, they're still being encouraged to see uh, the marker of a manhood, of, of a man being sexual conquest and being, you know, hooking up with, as they say, without feelings, um, with as many partners as possible, not treating those partners very well, and that that's what's presented to them as a path to status and as fun. And so when you hear boys in the locker room, you know, talking, they say, um, when they're talking about sex, they say, you know, I hammered, I banged, I nailed, I pounded, I piped. You know, it's like they went to a construction site, not like they engaged in an act of intimacy. And a lot of guys that I spoke with for the book were really struggling with that contradiction. Yeah, I was really taken by that idea as well. Um, you, you talked to a lot of young men who were engaged in either hookup culture or these traditional sort of facets of, of, of old school masculinity. And at times, they would even tell you that they were afraid of things such as intimacy. And it sounded a lot like in your conversations that you kept finding young men who felt as if hookup culture and misogynistic culture actually hurt them as well. Yeah, I think it really did. And I, I guess I feel like um, when I wrote Girls and Sex, I felt like girls were had been sort of systematically disconnected from their bodies and their desires Whereas with boys, it was almost more like they'd been systematically disconnected from their hearts. So they were particularly constantly wrestling with ideas of vulnerability, with what it meant to be vulnerable, with trying not to be vulnerable, with, you know, avoiding crying. That was a big taboo. So one of the guys that I spoke with said, you know, I never cry, I never cry. But then his parents got divorced and he wanted to cry. So he couldn't. And so he streamed three Holocaust movies back to back. And, you know, that worked. Um, but, you know, when we cut boys off from vulnerability, when we cut them off from their ability to feel, as they said, anything except for happiness and anger and put everything else behind a wall, we're cutting them off for, from an essential fundamental part of humanity. And, you know, we know Brene Brown always says that vulnerability is the secret sauce that keeps relationships together. Yeah, I, I, I found in my own research that, that young men are really detached from their own emotions and being able to communicate how mm -hmm. they feel about themselves and the, the world around them. And I, and I think that really cuts them off from um, the idea of intimacy. And I, I, I was really captivated by, in, in your book, where you would have these conversations with young men, and time and time again, it seemed as if the concepts that you were bringing up, whether or not it was intimacy or rewarding relationships or expression of their wants and their needs and their desires, it seemed like you broaching the subject with them might have been the first time that they've considered it. And at times, yeah. they seemed even shocked by it. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the amazing things about doing this work was 
first of all, how eager the guys were to talk. I really expected and worried that when I went to try to talk to teenage boys, you know, that I'd end up with whole transcripts that basically consisted of, uh-huh, you know, <laughs> that they would just be monosyllabic. Girls are the ones who have the reputation for chattiness, but given permission and space, and I honestly think that possibly because I'm a woman, um, that that gave them more permission to actually wrestle with their interior lives and to talk about feelings and to drop that mask. Or, you know, what they would always say is, I learned to put a wall up. I trained myself not to feel. You know, these really heart-piercing ideas. You know, one guy said, you know, we just learned to confide in nobody. Yeah, so as, as the author of, uh, of a previous book, Girls and Sex, how, how did you feel approaching this subject? I mean, th this is obviously some new territory. Um, you know, there are limitations in terms of gender communication. How, how did you feel as, as a researcher even coming into this project? Well, I have to say I kind of resisted doing it at all at the beginning because I just thought, you know, I've actually written about girls for 25 years, so that is really where I'm comfortable. That's the terrain that I know. But, you know, nobody was talking to boys, and nobody was hearing what they had to say in what is really a new era in terms of Me Too, in terms of technology, media, hookup culture, all the things that you've been starting to bring up and that we're talking about. Um, and we need to know what's going on inside of their heads in order to best guide them. And so I started doing that, and then, you know, Me Too exploded. And that really put a lot of attention on boys' behavior because we want to reduce sexual violence. But it also created an opportunity, I think, to engage boys in this kind of conversation about sex, about intimacy, about gender dynamics in a way that, you know, maybe is unprecedented. Yeah, you bring up the, the Me Too revolution, and in the book, it, it, it seems like it's, it's always a shadow sort of looming in the background of the conversations that you have. Um, the young men that you talk to uh, seem not only cognizant of it, but some of them uh, fearful of it, uh, some of them aware that it's something that they should be considering or something that should be changing their behaviors. Um, what are you finding with young men and how these changing dynamics are, are affecting them and how they see the world and their place in it? You know, everything that you just said, that whole gamut um, was, was what I found. Guys who were really wrestling with it, guys who were in denial, um, a lot of guys who, you know, the, one of the issues, I think, is that we think that Anyone who assaults is a monster, and only monsters assault. And as an overarching idea, that blinds us to the kind of everyday coercion and low-level, and sometimes not so level, sexual misconduct that ordinary guys engage in. And, you know, everybody thinks they're a good guy. Everybody thinks they're a good guy. But sometimes a good guy can do a bad thing. And that's what we really have to reckon with. So in a lot of ways, to me, in all of the Me Too allegations, the one that was sort of most interesting, even though I don't think it was particularly responsibly reported, was the story around Aziz Ansari. Because what he did was not a matter really of legality, but it was a matter of ethics. And it was sort of a very everyday, ordinary power dynamic where you have an over-eager guy who is pushing a young woman to do something she doesn't want to do and seeing her limits as a challenge that he's supposed to overcome. And that's really classic, and it's a great one to have a discussion about with boys. Well, you talked uh, near the end of the book after you've had these discussions and you've sort of gained an idea of what was going on in this culture. You, you talk a little bit uh, about this idea of the good guy, and you brought up uh, the Brock Turner case, of course, which is an infamous yeah. uh, situation of sexual assault. And you, you mentioned that there are these letters that are being sent out that say that he's a good guy. And, and the, the underlying inherent meaning behind these letters is that a good guy cannot commit these actions. Um, did you walk away from, exactly. your, from your research and your interviews feeling differently about our culture or how we respond to these situations or, or how we move forward? I walked away feeling that we have to have a lot more conversation with boys, both about what not to do and what to do, not only in the negative. But it is true that guys tend to over-perceive yes 
You know, they tend to see almost any, especially if they've been drinking. So in a kind of party hookup culture, they tend to see almost anything as a come on. And they are less likely to hear no when they're drunk. They're less likely to be able to perceive a partner's hesitation. And we've had a lot of conversation about the impact of drinking on girls' behavior or on girls' vulnerability. But I think that we really have to shift a lot of that conversation to really helping our boys understand how alcohol affects the power dynamics and behavior um, of boys. Well, I, I think what you're talking about is more or less in our culture sort of a taboo subject. Um, you talk a lot about sexual education and how it is um, just not not up to the level that we need to have in order to, you know, find a new way forward or to actually educate young men or anybody for that matter. You bring up the fact that abstinence education simply talks about it as a problem. Sexual education talks mm -hmm. about how to prevent problems. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you, when you finish this book, what your sort of idea of how sexual education or how our discussions in, in this realm should work? Yeah, you know, that's true, that we tend to, as Americans, focus on risk and danger. And I think we need to make a shift to responsibility and joy. And I have to say, I understand that most parents would rather poke themselves in the eye with a fork than talk directly to their sons about sex, and particularly about sexual pleasure and reciprocity. But the fact is that we really can't, don't have the luxury anymore of remaining silent about these issues, because when we don't talk to our kids in, the, in today's world, they're going to be educated by media and by porn, and we're not going to like the results. So, yes, talking to our kids about sex, talking to our boys about sex, but it's not only about talking about sex. It's also talking about media messages and gender dynamics and consent and all these other issues. And, you know, this time, this book was the first time, actually, that I was more prescriptive at the end of a book. In my past books, I've always sort of taken the reader into a, a scene or a place or a person who exemplifies what I think, you know, would be a way forward. But after nine years of writing about adolescence and sexuality, I felt like at this point I really had something to say. You, you lay a pretty substantial claim in the book uh, that parents have abdicated their responsibility in talking to their sons about sex. And at one point, you actually say, despite their ear rolling, eye plugging, and other superficial resistance, teenagers consistently <laughs> say they do want information about sex from their parents. But I think at, at the heart of a lot of the book is the talk about how that conversation isn't happening because of awkwardness or fear. And you actually mention at some point a, a, a really eye-opening uh, contrast between American culture and Dutch culture in which uh, Dutch children actually begin their sexual education as early as four um, as teenagers, uh, they have family-sanctioned sleepovers with their significant others as early as 14 or 15. And the results have shown that Dutch teenagers have better relationships. They actually have sex at later ages, and they report more satisfaction. I was wondering if you could talk about that, because I found that a really interesting concept. Yeah, and fewer partners, too. Um, yeah, you know, there was research that compared Dutch and American college students. This was with girls. Um, and they were, uh, so it was an apples to apples demographic comparison. And it was looking at their early sexual experience and found that, you know, the Dutch girls basically had everything that we say we want for our kids. They um, were pre prepared for the experience responsibly. They had lower rates of pregnancy, lower rates of STDs, lower rates of regret. They were less likely to be drunk. They were you know, more likely to be sober. They enjoyed it more. They said they could communicate with their partner who they knew very well. Like everything they had, Americans didn't. And when they dug deeper with those students, what they found was that Dutch um, students said that their parents, their teachers, and their doctors talked to them from a very early age about sex, about emotional intimacy, and about sexual pleasure. And it really made me think a lot as a parent myself that, you know, Americans tend to frame discussions about sex when we have them at all with our kids solely in terms of risk and danger. And it made me think about shifting that conversation to talking about responsibility and joy. And, you know, that, I don't know, like I said, I'm a parent myself, that, that shifted my mentality perhaps more than anything else I ever read about sex education. 
Yeah, and I, I think that's really telling because it, it, it sounds like the way that Americans approach conversations about sex, particularly between parents and children, is with apprehension and fear. And then yeah. when, I, when I read these conversations that you're having with young men about how they're approaching um, either their first sexual encounters or while they're navigating sort of the, uh, the politics of the whole thing out in the world, it, it's always happening outside of parents' purview. It's happening at parties. It's happening mm-hmm. at... Um, you know, unsupervised uh, gatherings where there's alcohol involved, right. there are expectations. And, and when you read your descriptions of it, it actually sounds pretty sinister and frightening for the people involved. There, there are a lot of miscommunications. There are a mm-hmm. lot of situations where, where people can make bad decisions or be put in danger. And it feels like the abdication of that conversation is, is really having an effect. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really true. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of ambivalence and there's um, a fair amount of trauma. And yeah, I mean, when you say um, kids roll their eyes, they plug their ears and hum, that's kind of what we're doing <laughs> as parents all the time. You know, like we know what's going on, but we just don't want to know about it. And one another thing that um, I found with the uh, that that I found in research about the Dutch was that they use the opportunity of doing things like you know, negotiating the terms of that sleepover with the significant other um, as another way to reinforce their values, as another way to talk about protection, as another way to talk about safety. So there's a way that it creates a kind of soft control um, over kids that we don't have. And in American culture, um, we just don't talk about it, and we pretend it's not happening, and, you know, the results are not great. Yeah, I have to say, even having an open conversation about the conversation on television feels a little revolutionary at times, right? Yeah, it sure does. And I'll tell. And with the with the guys themselves, they would say to me in the interviews all the time, you know, I've never said this to anybody before. I've never talked like this to anybody before. I never admitted this to anybody before. This is like therapy. You know, I got a lot of that. And I thought, you know, or they would say this was really like this conversation meant so much. I really, you know, learned so much. A lot of the guys stay in touch and. I thought, you know, I'm a stranger. Imagine if they could have these kinds of conversations with the adults that are actually in their lives or with their peers or even in their own heads. Yeah, when, when you're having these conversations in the book, it really struck me that it, it feels like you, you really found a level of intimacy with these young men to speak about things, again, that they had never talked about. And one of the things that keeps coming up in these conversations, and I think it's very notable, is the idea of fear. And it's, you know, th- this mm-hmm. insecurity, it's a fear of being judged, it's a fear of not fitting in, it's a fear of being excommunicated from from their groups. And I feel like you were able to move beyond that and, and find, I think, really at the heart of this thing is, is fear. Yeah, uh, yeah, a fear of vulnerability, a fear of shame, a fear of exclusion, all of that was there. And I think it was just a really rare opportunity for the boys that I talked to to have those conversations with somebody in a kind of protected space where, you know, nobody they actually knew um, was going to hear them talking about it. So it was, it was a little bit of a time out of time for them uh, and allowed them to have those conversations. Yeah, and I, I, I think the conversations you were having a lot of the time revolved around the idea of peer pressure. And it feels like mm-hmm. young men, uh, especially in a vacuum of their parents or, uh, you know, people, uh, their elders talking to them about sexuality, it, it, it's a lot of the peers who are filling that vacuum of the conversation. And, and it sounds like a lot Absolutely. of these conversations are uh, inherently dangerous at times. The idea of locker room culture, if we want to call that, uh, definitely plays into rape culture and, and misogyny mm-hmm. in the world. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of male insecurity and peer pressure and how it perpetuates these ideas. Yeah, you know, that 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 man box is very small, and it has to be policed and reinforced in a lot of ways. And so one way that guys stay in it is by being silent in the face of something that they know is wrong or violates their morals or in the face of misogyny or homophobia. And it's really hard. I had a lot of compassion for how difficult that was, especially for teenage boys with no support. So in one case, um, a a guy was telling me that on his crew team, he and a friend tried to stand up to a slightly older boy who was saying something, um, let's just say something despicable, um, about girls. And the other boys just laughed at them. They mocked them. And so the boy I was talking to had stopped talking 
and his friend continued to challenge sexism and misogyny when it came up. And this boy said to me, and I watched while he lost, he was marginalized. You know, the other boys um, stopped liking him as much, and he lost all his social capital. And here I was sitting with buckets of social capital, but I wasn't spending it. And then he stopped, and he looked really pained. And this was a, like a, a guy who was like a big jockey guy. And he looked at me with real, you know, like agony in his eyes, and he said, I don't want to have to choose between my dignity and being part of this group of guys but how do I make it so I don't have to choose? Yeah, I was actually, I had, I had that exact quote written down. It, it struck me, mm -hmm. I, I think, is getting really to the heart of, of a lot of this situation. I, I kept finding in my own research that men put on personas in order to mask their insecurity. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems with rape culture and misogyny is that a lot of these men who are insecure are playing characters, and they never understand that the other men around them are insecure as well, and you know it turns into a competition to see who can be um, the worst or the the least caring or the most yeah. misogynistic. And in in this case, um, it, it was a young man that you you named Cole for your book. Mm -hmm. uh, it felt like he was really lost in in your conversations, yeah. and it felt very much like this was a young man who understood the morality and the ethics at the heart of the, the debate and, and the situation, but felt powerless. And, and for you to talk to a young man like that and get to the, the cut of this, I, I, I thought was truly remarkable. Well, thank you. And I, and I really like what you say there about that sort of um, insecurity being underneath that competitive culture. And another, another place that I saw that was I got very interested in the word um, hilarious and how guys use that word. And that's another place where that, that acts as that kind of deflective shield or that mask, where if you f hear something that is, you know, reprehensible or uncomfortable or inappropriate or you know is wrong or is just, you know, violates your morals or, or disgusts you or you know it's misogynist or sexist, and you don't want to say anything because if you do, you're going to be targeted or ostracized, you can always default to saying, that's hilarious, and that is always a safe space. And hilarious becomes another way that guys are cut off from their authentic selves and their real emotions. And it's also another way that subverts a more compassionate response when girls and women are the subject of whatever reprehensible or disgusting thing they're saying is hilarious. And at the far end of that spectrum, I became really interested in reading and listening to stories um, of, you know, these high-profile stories of sexual assault by high school students. Um, so often, uh, they would, their defense when they're caught is, well, we thought we were just being funny. We thought it was hilarious. And I think that that word just encapsulates this way that, you know, you learn to disconnect. You learn to put up a shield. You learn to find this sp safe space. And if it's hilarious, then there's no problem. And certainly you don't need to feel any empathy. I'm really happy that you use the term safe space because I think with a lot of people who behave in misogynistic behavior or are part of this uh, objectifying culture or rape culture, um, you know, we'll sort of criticize the idea of a safe space or the idea of caring about how other people feel. But one thing that kept coming back around in your interviews with anybody who would say these really awful things that were obviously covering up their own insecurities is that these were people who did not feel as if they were safe and, and kept coming back around to the idea of they had to pretend in public. Um, what, what's the disconnect there? What, what's happening with young men who would make fun of these things and chide these things but are it seemingly in search of their own safe places? Well, I think it's really hard. I mean, it's hard. You know, when you're a young person, you want to be accepted. You want to be part of a group. You don't want to be ostracized. You don't want to be excluded. So I think boys need a lot of um, support and encouragement and discussion to start breaking that culture down. And, you know, we need to be able to connect boys to one another who want to do that. And I just, you know, I just got an email today, actually, um, from a boy who had read the excerpt of the book that was in The Atlantic. Uh, and he was 16, he was a junior in high school, and he wrote to thank me because he said it really made him feel um, like validated and like he could move forward in a better way 
um, from having heard the voices of these other boys. And so that's one of the things that I really hope with this book is that it can be a tool not only for parents but for boys themselves and that they can, you know, hear the voices of other guys and challenge some of this culture that a lot of them want to challenge and maybe open up a more meaningful dialogue between themselves and their peers or even just within themselves. Yeah, and I, I think there's an aspect to the book. I, I know for, for my own reading, there, there was a portion of it where you actually talk to young men who were actively engaged in hookup culture and were seeking sexual conquest. Um, they were having problems with intimacy. They felt detached from themselves and interactions with other people. There, were, there was a really profound loneliness and sadness to it, I thought. And you would mention that even some of them, in, in a couple of rare cases, were actually uh, what you would consider victims of sexual assault or taken advantage of by, by people. And they were unable to express that, maybe in the moment. And in some cases, the men around them even congratulated them for what they were doing, the self-harm and these, these situations where they were harmed right. by others. And I, I, I thought that was really telling. Right, because as one guy who had had a, a, a fairly traumatic first sexual experience said, you know, I would never tell that to my friends because as a guy, it's got to be great. You know, it's not even it's got to be great. It's always great. It is great. Um, and yes, some of the boys, it was interesting to me uh, how often the issue of unwanted sex came up um, because we really think of that as something that is just an issue with girls. But in fact, uh, boys experienced a lot of unwanted sex, and sometimes they would brush it off, or they would make it into a joke, or you know, it was a masculinity issue, so they didn't want to go too near it. But for a few of the boys, um, especially if it had been their first time, especially if they had wanted that first time to be significant and caring and with somebody that meant something to them, uh, if they had um, been taken advantage of when they were incapacitated or in some other state, they reacted very much the way girls react in that situation. They spiraled downward. They got depressed. They had trouble with their schoolwork. They became angry. They lashed out. But there was no place for them to really discuss that. And, you know, one of the guys said to me, um, you know, when I tried to talk to the girl about it, she just said, don't give me that. All guys want sex, you know. But if you can't say no, then you don't really have sexual agency. And that in itself is an issue. And beyond that, if you can't say no, I'm not so sure that you're going to really be able to hear it. Yeah, and I think that's a, a, a pretty important repercussion um, to, at the heart of all of this and, and the confusion about it and the uh, unwillingness to discuss it or really engage with it. And you bring up at one point, I thought this was a really telling section of the book, you wrote that um, jock culture uh, informed schools, fraternities, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, Hollywood, the military, and that it justifies misogyny and hostility. I was wondering if you could mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about that and what you think the repercussions are of, of these problems uh, going out into the world and going beyond just boys, young men, and sex. Well, it, it becomes a smokescreen, right? I mean, I, I particularly was talking about sports, I think, in that, quest, in that section and how... Um, you know, sports can be wonderful. You know, they can, it, it can, uh, it's team spirit, it's camaraderie, it's learning how to problem solve, it's learning about win wins and losses, it's learning about life, it's fun, you know? But that culture that supposedly builds character can, in some circumstances, become a smokescreen for the worst kind of bro culture where there's bullying, where there's an us against them mentality, where, um, guys bond by bragging about the ability to control the female body. Um, so all of that happens as well. And, you know, maybe not surprisingly, uh, athletes, by the time they get to college, are three times more likely than other guys to be brought up on charges of assault. Um, so that locker room talk, you know, for some, um, certainly goes beyond that. One thing that was really interesting to me was that a lot of boys that I spoke with who had loved the sport they were playing, had dropped out, not because they didn't love it, not because they weren't good at it, but because they really didn't like that, you know, that bro jock culture, and it, and it offended them, and they didn't know how to speak out against it, and sometimes it was being perpetuated by coaches as well. Um, so at the far end of that spectrum, one guy that I talked to who had been recruited at the college that he was at, um, he said he just, he couldn't 
handle the way that both the coaches and the players were talking. And so he not only dropped out of the sport, but he transferred to another school because it was a small school and he you know, felt that, the, that there wasn't room um, socially for him to maneuver after that. So that was, you know, that was pretty extreme. But I also really believe, and there's organizations like Coaching Boys into Men that bear this out, that those all-male cultures can potentially be a crucible of change. Um, and can be leveraged under the right circumstances to challenge some of these ideas and get guys talking about them. Yeah, um, you, you talk a lot about mentorship, whether it's with coaches or fathers, and where that can go right and where that can go wrong. In, in particular, mm -hmm. I was struck by the idea that young men desperately want their fathers to talk to them, and I think, and I think that would be a great resource yeah. for them to learn something uh, uh, about how to behave as men in the world, but it seems like from the book and, and certainly from uh, experience that uh, often yeah. older men give the wrong lessons and actually make sure that these young men are steeped in things like toxic masculinity and objectification and conquest culture, and, and it seems like there's a really pervasive influence with that. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, at, at what boys would say about their parents was that what they tended to be told was um, respect women, right? Respect women. But that was kind of meaningless. And one guy said to me, that's kind of like telling somebody don't run over a little old lady and then handing them the car keys. I mean, you don't think you're going to run over a little old lady, but you still don't know how to drive. And the guys would really talk a lot about wishing that their fathers or their father figures, whoever the man was in their life, would talk to them um, in a really honest way about sex and about intimacy and even, and this kind of surprised me, about their own regrets. And it made me think a lot about how, you know, I know that with fathers, their fathers didn't talk to them. There's not a culture that we have of dads talking to sons in a kind of authentic, connected way. But, you know, if you can take that leap, it would make such a difference. And I think you have to drop the pressure to feel like you have to be perfect when you do that, either in terms of what you say or in terms of who you are. You know, you can make a mistake. You can go back and say, you know, I wasn't quite right when I said that. Or you can say, hey, you're 16. We've never had a single conversation. That's something that I want to correct now. And I know it's going to be hard, but, you know, I want to do it. And even if you have not had the most success in your relationships, um, that doesn't mean you don't have some wisdom to offer to your son. Well, well, speaking of wisdom, I, I had a lingering question as I was reading your book, which is it, it seems like with a lot of these young men that you were one of the first people to talk to them about these subjects. Again, many of them mm -hmm. seemed relieved. Many of them uh, seemed to take to uh, your counsel and, and wanted to talk about these things openly. Um, as a researcher, how did you find yourself feeling in the middle of this? Did you feel like you needed to offer guidance? Did you feel it hard to be removed from it? What, how, did, how did you tackle that? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I feel such compassion for the boys that I spoke with um, and, and such a such a sense of connection to them, which is sort of, you know, how you can write about them. Um, I felt like I was doing something for them just by having the conversation, you know? Um, and it seemed, like you said, they felt such relief, and it seemed to um, get them thinking and just giving them kind of space and room to think through their ideas and to think through the things that had affected them. You know, that in itself felt like I was giving them something. So we, you've talked a little bit about some of the young men who felt relief from that and, and have kept in touch with you. Were there any young men who um, felt fear after talking to you or felt uncomfortable or were worried that opening up and being honest would somehow or another uh, be a damaging thing or they felt guilt? Um, I don't know how they felt afterwards. Uh, I don't know, um, honestly. I do. There were some guys, you know, of course there were not every guy just walked into the room and, you know, said everything that was in his heart. There were guys who were, in fact, monosyllabic, and there were guys who spoke a lot. So there was a real range. But, um, you know, my what I would hear mostly was that it was a positive experience for them. Okay, and I think anybody who picks up the book is, th there's a chapter earlier on in the first half of the book uh, which deals with um, the prevalence of online pornography and um, the... Mm -hmm. 
readiness of, of it out there. And you wrote at one point, and I, I had to read this line over a few times, you said that young people's erotic imaginations are shaped long before they've engaged in so much as a goodnight kiss, which, again, I had to keep going back to the beginning of that and move my way through and, and really think about the consequences of that. And, and when, when you had these discussions, it seems like with men and young women as well, that generations coming up with the Internet and, again, uh, uh, readily available pornography have a different understanding of sexuality, their roles in it, how it moves forward, and it also feels strangely divorced from um, uh, any real connection at times. I was I was wondering if you were shocked by that. Um, you know, porn has become the de facto sex educator for a generation of young people um, because we don't talk to them. We don't talk to them as parents. We don't talk to them in school. So, you know, curiosity about sex is natural. And, you know, for that matter, masturbation is natural and important. But what's different for this generation is that um, with the rise of the Internet and the smartphone and the dropping of paywalls on porn sites, they can get anything they want uh, and a whole lot of things that nobody wants at the touch, you know, at their fingertips on their phone. Um, so, and that shows them a, a, a distorted, you know, there's all kinds of porn. There's feminist porn, there's queer porn, there's ethical porn, but that's not what they're accessing. They're accessing what is easy, what's free, you know, the, the closest thing, and that tends to be um, images that show men, uh, sex is something that men do to women and female pleasure as a performance for men's pleasure, um, distorted bodies, uh, yes, obviously lack of connection, um, a lot of acts that would not feel good to most people. And absent any, you know, context or under personal understanding, that's, they, they will say, of course, I know that's not real. But we also know that when we absorb media, regardless of the kind of media, it affects our thoughts, our beliefs, and our feelings. So, yeah, maybe they know in some theoretical way it's not real, but then what exactly is it that they think is real? And they are definitely taking those ideas into the bedroom. Yeah, and in addition to uh, readily available pornography, you also get into um, these online social media dating apps, hookup apps, uh, yeah. that have really changed the way that, that people ab approach sexual relations. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about how that's affected the dynamics of it, how it's affected the people involved. It seems at times like this has been a boon for certain people, and for other people it's definitely been an obstacle. I think that's exactly true. I mean, the truth is, is that in college, um, obviously high school students um, aren't supposed to be on those dating apps, although we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, but the college kids use it kind of in a way, um, almost like a video game. You know, they don't really, there's a lot of, of back and forth, but there's not a whole lot of meetups. So there's a lot of sort of swipey, swipey, swipey. Um, one thing that was really interesting to me in the swipe apps was how much it brought out uh, sexual racism. And you'll see there's been a huge problem in those apps with people on the profile saying um, no Asians, no blacks. One guy that I talked to who was Asian American said he had been um, matched with a girl and they, they talked back and forth and it seemed nice. And then she said, well, you know, we can be friends, but no offense, I don't date Asian guys. And he was like, how is that no offense? Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting topic. Um, in, in the conversations that you, you talk about in this book, it seems like the young men you're talking to are more aware than ever of uh, this idea of diversity and inclusivity and sexual politics and the need to be politically correct, particularly out in the world. And, and, and in one moment, um, you had mentioned that there is obviously a more acceptance of things like LGBTQ communities, uh, but at the same time, your conversations feel like they're layered with homophobic slurs. Um, there is either misogynistic ideas or racist ideas that might be underneath the surface of this thing. How did you feel navigating the text and subtext of these conversations? Well, you know, that, it, it, that was what it was all about. That is really the heart of it, where this was this contradiction between, you know, the new messages that they're getting and the old messages that haven't gone away. Um, one of the, I had a real concern with gay boys in particular, that um, on one hand, you know, 
it's a new world. We've got a presidential candidate who's gay. We've got gay marriage. You know, there's you know there's queer eye. There's all this stuff where um, it's completely different. People, you know, straight boys have gay friends. Um, on the other hand, there was a way that that was all social, but that nobody was talking to gay boys about actually the sex part. And what was happening was that a number of underage boys, boys who were 15, 16 years old, were telling me about how they were lying about their age and going on grinder and hooking up with much older men, um, not telling anybody, not obviously, not telling their parents, not telling their friends. Uh, and that was really concerning. And I said to one guy, you know, if you were a girl and you told me that story, I would feel I had to report it to somebody. Why would I not feel that way in this case? And he sort of, you know, looked down and said, yeah, I, I, I don't know, it's really not, it's not great. So we really have to think about, with those guys, um, straight parents need to be better educated about um, the kinds of things that people of the same gender might be doing together. They need to talk to their sons, uh, their gay sons, about sex. They need to talk to them about their values around sex and intimacy. And they need to think about how they can provide them with social situations where they can have age-appropriate experience. Yeah, there's a, a really harrowing account um, from a, I, I believe it was a grinder encounter that you wrote about in which yeah. the, the young boy that you talked to said something along the lines of, I'm not going to say it was sexual assault, but I'm not going to not say it was not sexual assault. Yeah. Um, did you get a sense that the, these young men that you talked to were taking into consideration their own safety, whether or not it was imminent bodily harm or uh, sexually transmitted diseases? It seems like they're very aware of the political and social capital at risk here, but what, what about the actual body harm? Are you talking about gay boys in particular? Uh, any boys. Yeah, I mean, with gay boys, um, I, I did not, I mean, I, I really worried about a lot of the gay guys that I met. I worried about their safety on the dating apps. And I also worried that, you know, some of them weren't on PrEP, some of them were on PrEP. But either way, they often weren't using condoms. And rates of gonorrhea and syphilis, particularly in that community, are very high. Um, and becoming drug resistant. And so there's a way that, you know, if it's not HIV, it's like, oh, well, you know, it's not so bad. And we really need to talk a lot more to um, gay boys about the other risks besides HIV that they encounter and making sure that they're engaging safely and mutually and joyfully and allowing for human connection. Yeah, I, I was really stunned. Um, you mentioned in a lot of your conversations with LGBTQ boys that there are moments where they felt as if they're coming out or their conversations with their families, they, the, the ones you, you uh, spotlighted felt a lot less fraught with um, being excommunicated from their family, and they actually seemed accepted and as if they were comfortable with the people around them, save for, you know, some casual ignorance and, and, and things like that. But I, I wondered, what do you think the new challenges are as LGBTQ people become more and more accepted in society and, and have to sort of find their own way? What do you see as the, the future challenges or how do you see society sort of does better? Well, I think the imperative, and this is really the third rail of sex education classes, is to have education that's inclusive of the LGBTQ uh, perspective. Um, not only for those kids, but for all kids, because otherwise um, those behaviors and those identities and those sexualities are marginalized and stigmatized, and they're going to stay marginalized and stigmatized um, on some level unless that is more normalized in terms of people understanding. So I think that's a really big one. I do want to say that there was one thing about gay boys that I found both fascinating and really um, important, which was that they were much better able and equipped to navigate sexual consent and to kind of set the terms of a sexual encounter. And that was because, you know, they kind of had to be, because what was going to happen was not assumed or obvious. So they had uh, Dan Savage, who is um, 
an advice columnist writes a, a, a column um, on sex, says that gay guys will use um, what he calls the four magic words, which are, what are you into? when they are starting a sexual encounter. And so at the moment of consent, it's not just about yes or no, but it's about a conversation and an open-ended conversation. It's the kind of open-ended question that we really want to encourage you know, adults too, um, but kids in particular to be asking early in their um, sexual histories so that it's not about one person saying yes or no to a prescribed idea of what the other person has, but it's about having an open-ended um, conversation about creating an experience that's going to be mutually pleasurable, mutually gratifying, and um, mutually consensual for all. I like that idea of the four magic words, what are you into? But yeah. I also find myself... What are you into? But I also find myself thinking about the, those words and, and why American culture uh, would be so hesitant to use them or, or have more yeah. open-ended, honest conversations. After, after all of these interviews and interactions, what do you take away from that? What do you think it is that keeps Americans from having these conversations? Well, we just don't. I mean, it's just, we never have. So we're just, we, we just don't. And, you know, part of it is politics, part of it is culture. And the weird thing is that we live in this culture that is saturated with sexual imagery and yet are completely silent with our young people about what constitutes a respectful, responsible, mutually gratifying sexual experience. And, you know, when you actually start looking at that, it seems inexplicable and bizarre, frankly. Um, and, you know, like I said, if we don't talk to our kids, there are a bajillion messages that they're getting from the media about sex. And they're about female sexual availability. They're about male sexual entitlement. They're about disconnected sex as being the ideal. And, you know, that's what they're going to absorb. That's going to be their educator. After talking to the girls and boys and completing um, these two volumes, what surprised you the most? Uh, as a person uh, uh, diving into these projects and talking to all of these parties, what, what is the thing you're walking away from these two projects being the most surprised about or finding the most illuminating? I think the thing that for me was, has been the most valuable in doing it is actually learning how to have these conversations um, with, the own, own, with the young people in my life and just with young people in general. And, you know, I was not born being able to come on your TV show and start talking about sex. You know, I, I, I was just as reluctant and had just as little language as any person growing up in American culture. Um, but it just seemed like an imperative to me. And if I wanted to help young people uh, have more egalitarian, more connected, more respectful, more joyful sexual interactions and meaningful relationships, you know, I felt like I had to step up. So learning how to do that has really been the biggest thing for me. And what I've realized is that, you know, you can look at it as, as scary, you can look at it as awkward, you can look at it as, as excruciating, and it can feel that way. But it's also this opportunity to really connect on a different level with your child and deepen your relationship and build towards the adult relationship that you want to have with them and to show up for them and help them see how to have a difficult conversation because, you know, they're not going to be able to have difficult conversations if you don't learn how to do it yourself and model that for them. Well, I felt like you had very successful conversations and obviously were able to bridge uh, some of these intimacy gaps and honesty gaps that these young men were, were suffering from and, and, and certainly plagued them. What advice do you have for maybe any parents watching uh, who would like to have that conversation or people who would like to talk to men about these, uh, these topics? How do you begin? Where do you go? How do you form one of these relationships that is based on honesty and intimacy? Well, you know, that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> No, I, w I really wanted it to be a tool. And that last chapter, as you said, really offers a lot of ideas for types of conversations to have. And I was hoping that that would help parents um, to have the conversation and that it would help boys in reading it to have the conversation as well. Or even, you know, look, if you're watching this program right now, 
you can watch this with your son and it can spark a conversation. You don't have to say, you know, hey, tell me about you, but you can say, what do you think about what they're talking about? How does that play out in your life? What are you seeing among other guys that you know? And that's, you know, that's a place to start. You just have to start. Yeah, and you said something in the book, uh, in that prescriptive chapter, in which you said that boys don't just want the talk. They want multiple yeah. talks. They want an open dialogue between themselves and their parents or their mentors um, and, and, and just a continuous conversation. I mean, this is a very, very large topic that I think has a lot of reach in, in different parts of, of life mm -hmm. and culture. Um, what do you think is, is the, what do you think are the benefits of having this big, giant conversation? Well, what could be more important, really, than talking about your intimate relationships? They are the thing that is going to make you, that is going to determine your well-being in life. Research shows that over and over again, that, you know, it's our personal relationships that make the big difference in our well-being and in our happiness. So by having these conversations, you're helping set your son or your daughter up for having a far more fulfilled life. Why would you not want to do that? And from your conversations, did you feel like young men are hopeful about the direction of, of masculinity and, and manhood in America, or if they're feeling, like some have said, it's a very hard time to be a young man in America. What, what was the sense that you got moving forward with young men? I think they felt constrained, and I know they felt conflicted, but they also felt eager for something more expansive and for a way to, you know, to be a better man and to engage in intimacy, both emotional and physical, um, in a way that would be mutually gratifying and fulfilling. So I felt a real sense of hope that they wanted to have these conversations, that they wanted a better way, that they wanted to engage. And if that's the case, you know, that, that gives me great hope that there'll be a better way moving forward. So as an outsider, did you feel uh, walking away from this project and completing it, did you feel an overwhelming sense of hope uh, in, in terms of sexuality in America, or did you feel as if there are still several roadblocks and, and plenty of things that we have to take care of? Well, you know, we're in a very polarized country right now, and this is another place, you know, sex education is about as polarized as it gets. So that is a tough one, um, and I can't, you know, I don't know what to do about that, but but I do feel really strongly. I, I was so excited to write this book and so excited to get it out into the world um, because I felt like it really, you know, we do have this opportunity at this moment. And when I first started writing about girls, um, parents of boys would say to me, Phew, I'm so relieved to have a, a boy because I don't have to think about these things. And I would kind of think, Really? You think you don't have to think about these things? But that was the mentality. And that has changed entirely. And now parents of boys are so eager to hear about these things, to have these discussions, to read a book like this, because they too want change. And they realize that they are tasked with a big challenge of raising a man of integrity in a world that often gives boys a message that is the opposite. Yeah, I've actually noticed in recent years, particularly with the prevalence and rise of Me Too, uh, a lot of prospective parents talking about the idea of they're, they're actually fearful of having boys and of raising boys, and they feel like it's a larger job now for some, some reason. Um, what do you think is behind that anxiety at this point? I think what's behind that anxiety is again the lack of conversation. That somehow we think that if we that you know boys will if we if we raise boys in the way that we have in the past, yeah, I would say that's something to be fearful about. You you don't have a whole lot of say in what messages your son is absorbing and what way he's going to go. But if we are actually really thinking um, thoughtfully and intentionally about how we raise our sons, you know, I feel like when I first started. Um, writing about girls 25 years ago, uh, there was a lot of this same kind of anxiety around girls. But there were so many parents and advocates and activists and writers who began really engaging with the ideas of the contradictory and conflicting messages that girls were receiving. And, you know, we're not all the way there. There's a lot of work still to be done. But we're a lot further. And girls have a lot 
great, a much greater sense of opportunity and possibility and personal power. And I think now it's time we, that we bring our sons into that conversation and allow them to have that fuller sense of self so that they can be the men that, you know, we know they can be. Well, thank you, Peggy Orenstein, uh, author of Boys and Sex, a very important book that uh, I, I hope people pick up and read uh, front to back and then start right over again and share with their uh, <laughs> sons. Thank you so much for having me.